I will talk to you about one laptop per child using some countries that aren't in Africa, but talk more about Africa than is proportional to what we have done. And the idea goes back to not just 1982, it goes back further than that. But one of the criticisms we got early on was that we were beginners. And I thought, wow, we're not beginners. We've been doing this for a very long time. And what we've been doing is trying to understand how children learn, not how to teach them, not how to automate schools, not how to put a curriculum on a computer, but how do children learn? And in the first three years of your life, you do all your learning through interacting with the world, interacting with people, and that happens actually not the first three, the first six. And then suddenly you go to school, and there's a very different kind of learning. It's not that it's bad, but it's different. And our question has always been, can the first kind of learning be more seamless and continue? And this is particularly important in parts of the world where education with a capital E and schools with a capital S are crummy and in some cases don't exist. Or it's hard to get to it. So can you leverage the child? Not think of the child as an object that you're teaching and transference of knowledge, but can children actually be the agents of change in these countries? And that's a very different approach. And what was happening here in 1982 that was way ahead of its time, this young girl who didn't speak French or English played that keyboard like a piano. There was no difference between her behavior and kids in suburbs of Boston or New York. And so 20 years or 19 years later, after a lot of things happened in between, this picture, which is Cambodia, not Africa, the previous one was Senegal, um, was really about a school that I had been involved with for reasons of chance. And these kids, who all took laptops home at night, were in a village that had no electricity, no telephone, no television. And in fact, there are five of these schools. Two of them had no roads. You could only get to the village on a motorcycle or walking. And when they took their laptops home, they illuminated the house. It was the light source for the house. And the kids were connected to the internet, were doing things that were absolutely incredible. In fact, every child, or I think maybe there's one exception, and this is 2001, is still in school today. They're still in college or you know, still studying, which is extraordinary. And one of the reasons kids drop out of school is not that they're wanted or needed to work in the fields and work for their families, is school is boring. School's not relevant. And so now, sort of many years later from when we started, we decided we'd do one laptop per child in 2005, um, not because we wanted to build a laptop, but because there wasn't anything out there. And there certainly wasn't anything very child-centric. So, Today, there are about three million of these around the world, which is a smaller number than I had hoped, but is nonetheless three million. And some countries, Uruguay is one of them, has done every single child in the country. And Rwanda will be the first African country to do every child in the country. And that completely changes the landscape. Once you've got every child connected, and in the case of Uruguay, it's every child from five to 15, so you go to Uruguay on a vacation, and you see a kid, they're walking around with a little green laptop. And this happens to be Nepal. Uh, the reason I show this one, of it's Peru. It's not Africa. But this child is one of many in Peru. There are about a million of these in Peru. And while I can't give you the exact number, something like half the kids are teaching their parents how to read and write. Now, if that doesn't put goosebumps on your goosebumps, I have nothing really to tell you. Because it, it really is the ch child being sort of the agent of change, Australia, Peru. Uh, and in Africa, when we were in Nigeria, when Rory uh, came to actually see us, I have to tell you, we spent a lot of time designing the handle on this laptop. And uh, <laughs> this is not a posed picture. This is literally how she, she brought it to school. And what kids do together, there's very wonderful project called Hole in the Wall in India. The man, Sugata Mitra, is actually here in England. And this is what children do collectively. And it's, it's absolutely critical. In this photograph, I show it because this teacher had never, ever 
seen a computer or used a computer, but always taught. It's a, rote learning is worse in the developing world than it is in the United States or England. It's terrible here, and it's terrible in the United States, but it's even worse when you go to India. It's worse when you go to Africa. The, the whole drill and practice and singing songs and memorizing and think, it's really bad. This is the way he teaches now. And the kids run to school. And the parents hang in them, you know, into the classroom from the windows from out. And parent involvement, truancy goes to basically zero everywhere we've been. And discipline problems basically vanish. This is the machine we showed five years ago. It's a little silly, but everybody remembered the pencil yellow hand crank. And it really isn't because we're in places that don't have electricity. So it has to crank um, and, or it has to have some auxiliary kind of power. We're a nonprofit. That was very important in the beginning to create a nonprofit. I've never drawn a salary. A whole profit structure is to be a nonprofit so you can go to somebody and there is no margin, there is no benefit. In other words, if a head of state decides to do a million laptops or does 100,000, it makes no difference whatsoever. And that's very important because it makes the, the mission much more credible. It's not a market. Children are a mission, not a market. Um, those are the statistics, not very important. That's the laptop if you haven't seen it. Now, it converts into an electronic book, and that's a little bit sort of boring perhaps, but think of it this way. Each laptop has 100 books on it. That doesn't take much space, so to put 100 books on a laptop is, is pretty trivial. But when you ship 100 laptops into an African village, which we've done many times, each laptop has 100 different books. So that's 10,000 books. Most people in this room did not have 10,000 books in primary school. And what's fascinating about that is that Africa and other parts of the world, but particularly Africa, is by definition going to lead the electronic book revolution because you can't ship books. And if anybody suggests shipping paper books to Africa, they are just out of their minds because you can't physically get the 10,000 books to each village. It's not possible. So the electronic, just like cell phones in some sense, the developing world adopted them on a per something faster than we did, is because there wasn't anything there before. There was no legacy, and you couldn't. Uh, in some places, you didn't need to introduce it. Electronic books are absolutely necessary. The other thing that we did, which is technical but important is we made each laptop into basically a router. So when 100 or 1,000 laptops go into a village, they're all connected automatically to each other in an ad hoc network. So at minimum, the kids can have a local Facebook, if you want to call it that. Uh, but then if one child is connected, all the others are connected, which is very important because you're going into places that don't have connectivity. The machines that we have in Ethiopia, I would say half of them aren't connected, which is a shame, but we still work to, to get them connected as fast as possible. And the rest of my remarks are really sort of country-centric and sort of having you know, done the three million roughly laptops, what have we learned? Well, I'll tell you what we've learned. We've learned that it works. It actually works, and it's cost-effective. It costs, because now we know what the maintenance cost, and the, it costs $1 per week to buy, maintain, and update this particular laptop. Now, others can be close to that, too. I'm less concerned about whether it's this laptop or another laptop. But a dollar a week, that's still, that's high. I'm sure a we'll, dollar a week is not low enough. but. Most people, when they criticize it, they look at the upfront cost, which any bank, like whether it's the World Bank, the African Development Bank, or private banks, can, including the cost of money, amortize it and get it down to a uh, dollar a week. So the economics work. What happens is that, and I'll show you, and this is the classroom. Um, this classroom teacher, this is Uruguay, um, had heard that the president of Uruguay stated publicly that his legacy would be one laptop per child, and every child in Uruguay would get one in 18 months. She had been teaching for 30 years. 
and she said, you know, I've been teaching for 30 years. I'm just not ready to do this. So she went to the Social Security office and asked for early retirement, which wasn't that early. She was a few years early. And they said, sure, come back in 10 days. It'll take us 10 days to process it. And in between, the laptops arrived in her classroom. And so her kids are unpacking them and so on. And within three days, she figured out what was going on and went racing back to the Social Security office and asked for late retirement. Because she just saw that the energy of the class, the things, and one of the assignments she gave was to do a project on cows. A young girl at seven or eight in this class went home and sort of was talking to her parents and said, you know, I don't have any great ideas. And father said, you know, you're very lucky because our cow is giving birth tonight. And so she stayed up, and there's a camera in, inside the laptop, and she videoed the birth of the cow. And she brought it home as her, pro brought it to school as her project. And it was so gripping. And so everybody, it was by far the best project in the class. And as a class, they figured out how to upload it onto YouTube, which was done and had about 100,000 hits. And the teacher had never expected that her homework assignment would have 100,000 hits. But just imagine the self-esteem that that young girl gained just in that one episode. She wasn't a particularly good student before it, but boy, she's been a very good student after it. Um, we've only been on one postage stamp, but it's, I I'd never thought of it as an aspiration. Um, I could talk about Mongolia, but to stick to my 15 minutes, Ethiopia, this is not a great picture, but it's a classroom in Ethiopia. They don't have as much connectivity, and what they've all become is very good programmers. Uh, and the, the machines that we have, kids have really learned how to program, and I think that that's absolutely critical. And I'd actually like to end on that thought, because one of the regrets I have when I look back 30 years or more is that computer programming sort of fell off the table. I know 25-year-olds who have had the best education, gone to the best schools, and really been diligent and all the rest, and have never written a computer program in their life. And if you haven't, do, for God's sake. And the reason is that writing a computer program is the closest you can come to thinking about thinking. So if you take an idea or and you turn it into an algorithm and you write that into code, guess what? It doesn't work the first time. By definition, it's not going to work unless you're a real genius and different than everybody else on the planet. It's not going to work. And so what happens is it does something else. Let's say you wanted to draw a circle, it draws lines or something. And you look at that, and you debug the program. You say, well, the behavior. And you go back in, and you change the code, and then you run it again. This is an iterative process. And guess what? Eventually, it's the circle. And you have in that process, as a child, six, seven, eight, nine years old, you're actually watching, sort of from the outside, learning. You're learning about learning, because what you're doing when you're debugging that program is you are doing the closest approximation to what you want yourself to do. And it's really quite fascinating. We found that in the 1970s that kids that wrote computer programmers were better spellers. And why were they better spellers? Because they fell in love with the errors. You got two wrong out of 10. That was a B. I loved the B. I hated it. I didn't even shove the words under the carpet, not the debuggers. So these kids are actually writing very sophisticated programs. And maybe I'll leave the rest for discussion and stop on that picture. But, but they are really thinking about thinking, which is quite, to me, quite extraordinary. Thank you very much.